Hi, everyone. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, everyone, for being here today, um, both everyone here in person and anyone tuning in online. Um, yeah, it's really a pleasure for me to be speaking here today. Uh, for me, it's kind of like the situation of a longtime listener, first time caller. Um, I've gotten so much out of this community throughout the years, like throughout my time as a student and then now working in the industry. So, yeah, it's really a pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, and to, to start, so I'm, my name is Scott Murakami. Uh, I'm an engineer at Embody, uh, working on the pro audio team, doing audio software development. Uh, and today, today the talk is entitled uh, Leveraging Juice for Developing Spatial Audio Plugins. And today we'll be focusing on a specific type of um, spatial audio plugin for virtual acoustic reproduction. Uh, so virtualizing a real acoustic space and rendering the playback through headphones. Uh, and yeah, today's talk will be sort of general best practices and some features of Juice to utilize in developing such a system. So first, talking about the motivation. So why there's a need for virtual production tools. Uh, so first, mixing on headphones is on the rise. Um, you know, everyone's on the go these days. Uh, there's an increasing amount of immersive content out in the world, streaming platforms. You know, a, a lot of the bigger companies are starting to uh, adopt and kind of focus on this as well, including Apple. Um, sort of like a lack of accessible multi-channel speaker setups, because it can be quite restrictive to work with um, multi-channel audio and spatial audio because you need, you have the physical restriction of, you know, you need the physical space and this, this uh, multi-channel array, you need lots of speakers, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, and then also, you know, the ability to mix and monitor in different environments in the box uh, and to quickly change between these environments to, you know, reference your mix or, or work in a, in a situation that you're comfortable with, work on the go. Um, so yeah, the question that we ask is, uh, what if you can replicate the experience of working in a physical space with uh, multiple speakers, this, this surround sound setup, but what if you can um, work in this environment anywhere and in headphones? So much more cost effective. And as I mentioned, the goal is to replicate real life acoustic spaces, particularly these with surround sound setups. Uh, and yeah, basically just replicate it using only a computer and a pair of headphones. So here we have a real uh, studio. Um, this studio is equipped to do 7.1.6 uh, Dolby Atmos setup. And this is the studio, uh, this is Studio M at Hans Zimmer's Remote Con Control Productions. Uh, this is the lead engineer, um, someone by the name of Alan Meyerson. And so he's made his mark as one of the greatest uh, movie mixers of the modern era. So his career is quite prolific, spanning more than four decades, over 200 credits, multiple Grammy wins. And um, yeah, he's well known as Hans Zimmer's engineer. So the question begs is, what if you can have his setup, but uh, replicated virtually? So uh, quickly, just to uh, kind of talk about a key aspect of this whole spatial audio uh, world and a, a key um, a key piece is uh, this idea of personalized head related transfer functions or HRTFs. Um, so you see here there's an image of six people's ears. This is taken from the CIPIC database. Uh, I believe it's from UC Davis. Um, but the the key takeaway here is that basically so the the human pinna or the exterior shape of the ear is um, also known as acoustic fingerprint, because similar to your, your fingerprint, uh, your, your ear, the shape of your ear, the folds and all this stuff is unique to you. So you can think of this as like a unique filter, and, and it's a key, key piece of how we hear sound spatially. Uh, and for example, like if a sound is coming in front of us, behind us, to the side, um, how our ear and our unique filter uh, filters the sound and works with our brain to identify where the sound is coming from is, is very important. Um, so what this allows us to do is utilizing this, this uh, HRTF or PHRTF for personalized, personalized for each user, 
is that it kind of allows us to like sort of trick the brain into hearing sound coming from specific directions, uh, but only on two channels. So in, in, in the case that's discussed today is over headphones. And headphones are, perf are the perfect reproduction device for this because, um, because you have isolation between each channel, left and right. Uh, because in a physical space, so for example, if you're trying to do this over two speakers, then there's a lot of interference with crosstalk from each speaker. So for example, like what's coming from the left channel, you're going to hear in the right ear and vice versa, plus reflections in the room, which can damage the uh, spatial accuracy. So headphones are perfect for this. Uh, and here's just the overall generalized architecture of developing such a system. So you have your input audio uh, coming in. You have your personalized HRTS, which you apply. Um, and this is used to, to sort of like um, replicate the sound in space. So, so you uh, convolve HRTS at a specific location with um, where you want the speakers to be set up to sort of simulate like a virtual uh, speaker at each location. You have your overall uh, studio acoustic response. So this is measured for each speaker and listener location. Um, and then also you can apply sort of like a, if you want to refer to it, it's kind of like an overall room EQ. So like the general characteristic of the room. Plus you have your speaker response. So this is related to each, specific, uh, each speaker's specific frequency response. So you know, depending on brand, model, et cetera. Uh, speaker delays, which you need to account for, you know, based on listening position, you have a distance to each speaker, which you have to account for. Um, since this is uh, for reproduction over headphones, you also have to account for the headphone EQs and adding this sort of like compensation filter for um, the coloration that each different headphone will will apply. Um, and also, the last step is a uh, kind of more like the artistic aspect of it, of perceptual tuning. So this is done with critical listening by mixing and mastering engineers. And uh, you know, they do the, the fine tuning from there. And then finally, you have your output binaural, binaural spatialized audio. Uh, and the key takeaway here is that there's a lot of convolutions. So for example, each step, like the convolution for HRTF convolution, uh, the overall studio response, the speaker response, headphone EQ. So just to give you an idea, so per channel, you have your HRTF, your speaker EQ, because you know the speaker, you might have different speakers, you might not have all the same speakers. Uh, and then the speaker reverb. So just to give you an idea, stereo is only two channels, but you have six, so three per channel plus an overall room EQ, plus the headphone EQ. So that comes out to eight convolutions. Or take Alan Meyerson's room, for example, 716. You already have 41 convolutions. So it's quite a lot. So here's just an example of um, the measurement process. So in the actual space, at the, the mixer's listening position, um, using some sort of dummy head or binaural microphone to capture uh, all these different responses from the speakers themselves, from the room, et cetera. You know, playing back some sort of um, like a sign sweep through the speakers, through the room, capturing the, the response there. Uh, yeah, here's, so here's a similar image of the um, virtualized version of the room, but here you can see uh, in the middle is the listening position. You see uh, there is the, you're just lines showing um, angles to each speaker, azimuth, elevation, distance, which all have to be accounted for. Um, and yeah, so that brings me to um, convolution. So convolution is you know the main sort of process the, that's that's happening here. Um, and here's just a nice little graphic from uh, three blue, one brown. Uh, so convolution by itself can be a computationally expensive operation. Um, you know, especially when you factor in loading impulse responses on the fly. So which 
is what we're doing. So, you know, if you want to model multiple spaces or if you want to switch between different headphones, uh, then you have to consider loading these impulse responses on the fly and switching on the fly so you don't get any audio, audio artifacts or dropouts. Uh, and yeah, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of impulse responses to manage. Uh, so proper management and efficient use of resources becomes vital, uh, especially for real-time processing. And as I mentioned, the computational strain, so just convolution process by itself is, uh, can be expensive. Um, but in this case, you know, it's not just the convolution process itself that can, that, that can apply this uh, computational strain, but also when you factor in the loading impulse responses and dealing with that on the fly. So that brings me to um, Juice's convolution, which has been invaluable for us. Uh, yes, invaluable for harnessing performance. Uh, and it, it helps make loading impulse responses on the fly really easy, as I mentioned, without these audio artifacts, uh, which is very important when switching between multiple spaces. Um, and yeah, so, um, you know, this juice has been very helpful for us, and convolution in particular, uh, for its performance benefits, because, um, you know, otherwise we would have had to had our own implementation. But also quickly, just to go through convolution, not dig too deeply into the DSP, but um, just a general overview of convolution and sort of like the convolution theorem of talking about how uh, convolution in one domain, so take, uh, take convolution in the time domain, is equivalent to doing multiplication in the frequency domain. So you take a FFT, get your signal into the frequency domain, and multiply from there, which will apply the convolution. Uh, so in, in that case, luckily, Juice handles a lot of this for us, uh, as well as some other optimizations. Uh, and yes, optimization is key to addressing um, this problem and, and addressing this market, because um, I don't know, as many as, you know, there's a room full of audio engineers. Um, audio engineers are always pushing the, pu pushing the limit of the computer, you know, trying to reduce buffer size to to reduce latency, increasing sample rates, to uh, get better frequency resolution. Uh, and then as I mentioned, you know, requiring this option of, of, or this requirement of needing to switch between multiple rooms very quickly. Because you know, as an audio engineer, it's always nice to uh, A, B your mix in different environments. So reference your mix in different environments, but also um, quickly A, B different, different um, environments. So yeah, we, we, uh, we, we need all of this to be handled very smoothly. Uh, and then yeah, loading an impulse response into a convolution uh, engine can be quite expensive. Um, and yeah, you can't, can't do this on the audio thread, so it has to happen on, on um, background threads. Uh, so another sort of friend to the convolution class that is, uh, very helpful is this Juice Convolution message queue. So this is very handy. Uh, what it does is it allows convolution objects to share background threads for loading impulse responses. Uh, because threads like memory and disk space are a limited resource, and you don't want these to grow out of control. So it can quickly become a mess. Um, it's basically, so without using this message queue, um, each instance of a convolution object will have its own background thread, which it uses to load uh, an impulse response. But using this message queue, um, you know, it cleans a, a lot of it up. So it'll, it'll use a, a single shared thread between all of your convolution um, instances. So what you want to do is you want to create an instance of the convolution message queue. Uh, construct convolution objects and passing in the queue uh, upon construction. So here's just a little code example. You know, you have your uh, instance of a, a message queue where you can pass in um, uh, a, a fixed number of entries. Uh, you can ignore my poor choice of variable naming of n. I, uh, I more so want to focus your attention to, to the juice input parameters aptly named num entries. 
And then um, from there, when you're, you're creating your instance of a convolution object, then you pass in, it takes in this reference to the queue, which will then um, use this queue to, to you know, as, as mentioned, share just a single thread uh, amongst all your convolution instances um, for loading the impulse responses. Uh, so yeah, also quickly, I, I wanted to touch on Juice not just um, being very valuable for its engineering solutions, but also Juice uh, in, in the team management aspect. So the abstraction of Juice is it's very helpful. Uh, the modularity aspect of Juice, uh, and for us, uh, you know, it, it's it's a great tool because it's a great learning environment for developers um, because of uh, both the aforementioned points of abstraction and modularity. And you know, as developers gain experience, they can dig, dig deeper into the lower levels of abstraction. But you know, from a team management perspective, it allows uh, developers of different, of varying degrees of experience to be able to work uh, seamlessly together on projects. Um, you know, because of these different levels of abstraction, um, and yeah, so it, so it allows for a, for a very it, it's a very seamless tool to allow uh, developers of different experience levels to work together and contribute equally on a project. But also, you know, it's a really good tool for for more senior engineers to also um, use to teach uh, more junior engineers. So that is something that we found very valuable too. Uh, so yeah, conclusion. Uh, Juice offers practical and effective engineering solutions. Um, and for us, helping to address the challenges presented in developing a virtualized spatial acoustic system with uh, a lot of these loudspeakers. And yeah, as mentioned, the benefits of Juice ex extend beyond just engineering. It's a great learning environment for developers and allows for seamless collaboration uh, amongst different backgrounds and of experience. So, yep, thank you. That's my talk. Thank you, Scott. Uh, uh, I was wondering, uh, convolution operations introduces lags lag uh, between the input and the output. So do you, f if in the real time context, do you face challenges trying to compensate the lag between the inputs and the outputs? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I suppose that, that that's a challenge that, that we face. You know, it's like, as I mentioned with, uh, with audio engineers and especially you know, especially with uh, mastering engineers, like latency is very important. Um, so, yeah, this is something we always have to consider, and just you know, trying to do as much optimization as we can to uh, try to reduce the amount of latency in a system like this. So, uh, yeah, this is this is something that we're constantly battling. Thank you.